Hello guys, I know this is afternoon after lunch and now we are going to talk about the storytelling but trust me it's going to be more engaging and uh, the speaker is Tanya Bhattacharya and she's a storyteller and story seeker and spotter. Uh, she looks at the, the world in a lens of stories and she inspires to do the same to the others and she has facilitation experience of more than 20 years. She has worked in two major corporations during her career in L &D, uh, as an l and resource, managing a sizable team spread across Indian states. Without taking more time, I would like to call Tanya. It's on. We need to on. Did you have lunch? Yes. Good afternoon. Can I request everybody to stand up for a bit? Stand up and spread around the room. Be in a spot where you can see me. It's important for you to see me. I've come here all the way from Electronic City. You better see me. <laughs> so spread around the room. Be in a spot where you can see me. We're going to do something which is called a see as I, sorry, say as I say and do as I do story. So whatever I say and whatever I do, you have to say and do with me. Is that okay? Great. Uh, for now. Oops. Can we do that a little later? That's uh -huh. okay. I'll break the suspense now. Whatever I say, whatever I do, you have to stand do with me. Ready? First of all, loosen up your body. Yeah? Don't be embarrassed. You can just wave your arms around for a little bit. Very good. Now let your arms fall by your side. Okay, and here we begin. Once there was a mountain. You are far more than I am. I'm louder than you. I know I have the mic, but you can outdo me. I'm pretty short. Once there was a mountain. Once there was another mountain. On this mountain lived a goat. And on this mountain lived another goat. Now this goat was hungry. So it came down the mountain. Toing, toing, toing. There was grass on this side. There was grass on the other side. The grass on the other side was greener. There was a river. There was a bridge. So the goat went over the bridge. Tuck, 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 tuck. Hop, hop, hop. Hop, Tuck, 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 tuck. Toying, toying, toying. Now this goat was hungry. So it came down the mountain. Toying, toying, toying. There was grass on this side. There was grass on the other side. The grass on the other side was greener. There was a river. There was a bridge. So the boat went over the bridge. Tuck, 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 tuck. Hop, hop, hop. Tuck, 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 tuck. Toing, toing, toing. Next day. Both the boats were hungry. So they came down the mountain. Toing, toing, toing. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Big problem. Narrow bridge. This one said, move. Why should I move? You move. Ah. Ah. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Toing, toing, toing. Next day, both the goats, twice as hungry, came down the mountain. Toing, toing, toing. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Now this one said, very sweetly. Swalpa are just muddy. Sure. Uh uh uh. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Cop, cop, cop. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Now this one said. Very sweetly. Swalpa are just muddy. Sure. Uh uh uh. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Toying, toying, toying. Happy ending. Thank you.
to you. Please have a seat. My name is Tanya Bhattacharya, and I'm a storyteller. You must have gathered by now. Uh, I thought I'll just prove it to you that I am a storyteller. <laughs> I have a 10-year-old daughter, and uh, her name is Trisha. When she was about seven, a little over seven, is when the pandemic hit, and we were all under lockdown. Now, for a seven-year-old, being home alone with the adults, it was quite frustrating for her. So she asked if she could have a play date with a friend of hers who lives in the same community as us, but on a different floor. So I called up her friend's mother, and I said, would you be so kind and please send me who over for a play date to our house? We've not been meeting anyone. You've not been meeting anyone. Maybe we can get the girls to play together. And she said, oh, I couldn't have asked for more. Please take her away. Now, the girl came to our house with her backpack with a lot of things in the bag, and uh, her toys, books, play cards, etc. And she spent a good two hours in our house. Now, these girls, initially, they played very happily for about a couple of hours, and then they started to fight. And I had had enough of the screaming and shouting, and I said, both of you come here, and I told them the two good story. And then I asked them, if this is Trisha and if this is Miku, what should you do when there's conflict? Guess what the girl said? Exactly. That was the day and to date. They haven't forgotten it. I'm rarely around. I'm a mother who travels quite a bit. But if I'm around and I spot the girls fighting, I just have to remind them, remember the two goat story, and they go squealing, Swalpa Arjas Mari, Swalpa Arjas Mari. Why am I sharing this with you at a product leadership forum? Stories are amazing and beautiful because whatever you share through stories, those things end up sticking. If there was ever a business case for storytelling, this is it. It works for children and it works for adults too. But you don't have to take my word for it. We are going to do a quick test. If it's not, oh, it is. Can I have that slide? OK, so that's OK. I'll tell you when to change the slide, OK? So um, we are going to look at why do people like stories so much and why do they work for adults, and this is how we're going to do it. We'll, we're going to do a quick test. The test is going to be in this form, that I am going to tell you some very interesting facts about, can I request you to go to the next slide? Yeah, just keep it here. So um, it's going to be about, these facts are about a bush which is called a yew bush, and it has berries on it, okay? Now, it's found in large parts of America, in large parts of Europe, and in some parts of Asia as well. Once I'm done sharing those facts with you, I'm going to ask you some follow-up questions. And let's see who answers them correctly. Is that okay? But no taking pictures. I trust your mind to process what I'm sharing with you. Show me thumbs up if you agree. Great. So now, here are some very interesting facts about you, Bush and Berries. Uh, yew bush, um, so the entire yew bush except the aril, which is the red flesh of the berry, and uh, every other part of the bush is highly toxic. Uh, it's poisonous. And uh, this bush has toxic, um, you know, it has a group of toxins or chemicals which are called taxine alkaloids. Yew berries may also cause death without any prior symptoms. The taxine alkaloids are absorbed very quickly by the intestine, and once the intestine absorbs them in high enough quantities, then it can also cause death due to cardiac arrest or respiratory failure. And if we can the, go the, make the facts go away, shift B, shift B. That's why you should have control of your product in your own hand. <laughs> so, so here were some facts about you, Bush and Berries. My first question to you, how many of you will remember what you just heard, say, a week from now, with a show of hands? Will you remember it a week from now? You would? What background do you come from? Oh, that's how wonderful. Although I didn't tell you one yet, but I'm so glad you'll remember. What's your name? Ram. In a room full of about 50, 60 people, there's at least one person who'll take back what I shared. I am deeply touched, but I'm also a little disappointed because you're the only one who'll take back what I shared with you, which means I have failed miserably to communicate what I wanted to communicate. It's only one person will take back what I said. 
uh, how can I do this differently? Now I'm going to try doing it differently. I want to introduce you to this gentleman called Ben Hines. Ben Hines was a 32-year-old guy, and he had only two passions in life. The first one was gardening, and the second was playing the guitar. Now, Ben Hines is someone who you would call a homegrown gardener. You know, people who are born with two green thumbs, whatever they touch, it just blooms and blossoms. So he, when he was working in his mother's garden, their uh, garden looked absolutely beautiful and glorious. So the neighbors soon started to ask, Mrs. Hines, what are you doing? Your garden looks exceptional. She said, don't ask me. It's all Ben's doing. He's gifted. Now, Ben started to get uh, gardening assignments in the neighborhood, and he was going to everybody else's house and working in their gardens. Very soon, the entire street looked beautiful, green, and lush. People from other neighborhoods now started to ask, what are you guys doing? Who's your gardener? And you get the drift. Now, by now, Ben had become extremely popular and sought after, and he had a roaring gardening business. The local authorities had heard about him, and they invited him for a project. Now, this was going to be a slightly different project than he, what he was used to. They told him that there is a pond, which is at a slight distance, a few miles away from where he lived. And they said that, well, it's in shambles, it's in very poor condition. We were hoping you can make it more habitable, you know, clear up a patch and get people to come uh, hang there over weekends with their kids, with their pets, with their picnic baskets and um, sheets, with their cakes and juices, frisbees and probably badminton, and make it into a picnic site. He was very excited by the prospect, and he took up this project because he had never worked in wilderness before. He spent an entire day near the pond, the pond area, clearing up a patch, and it looked very pristine and clean. At the end of the day, he stood with his hands on his waist, very happy to look at uh, you know, how, how nice that place looked. And he was just imagining, once he was done with this place, after an entire week, uh, it was going to be more than habitable. And uh, this is where... Um, now, this is, but now he had to rush back home. He got back home. He changed into a fresh set of clothes because he had dirted himself. He picked up his guitar. He went to uh, play at the local pub where he played three times a week with his, with his band. He sat on a three-legged stool with his guitar, guitar on his lap, and he strummed it while the rest of his band stood and did their gig. Half an hour into the performance, Ben Hines falls flat on his face, and he loses consciousness. His friends splash water on his face, and he still wouldn't wake up. So they took him to the hospital. Now the pub owner knew Ben Hines' mom. Typically, that's what happens. Small communities, people know people. So they, um, he calls her up and says, Mrs. Hines, Ben had been, uh, you know, he lost consciousness. He's been taken to the hospital. Why don't you get there fast? As soon as she heard it, her heart started to beat so fast, she felt it would beat right out of her chest. She was so anxious. She drove for 20 minutes to get to the hospital, and those 20 minutes were the longest she had ever driven through traffic without making sense of what she was doing. She was made to wait for 10 minutes in the, uh, in the waiting room of the hospital, and those 10 minutes were the longest she had ever waited for news to come. The doctor came out and said, sorry, Mrs. Hines, we couldn't revive Ben. As soon as she heard it, she, she, she didn't know what to do, what to say. She said, I don't understand. The doctor said he was already dead by the time he was brought in, and we couldn't revive him. She said, I still don't understand. The doctor said we'll have, we will have to perform an autopsy. The autopsy came out, report came out three days later with a toxology report, which said that there were very high quantities of a toxin which were found in his body. They're called taxine alkaloids. Now, they're very funny kind of toxins, and they are found in a very peculiar place. Now, I, m I must show you where he got those toxins into his system from. Remember the pond where he had spent the entire day? Um, cleaning up the bushes and in the wilderness. This is called a yew bush. It has red berries on it. The only part of the bush which is non-toxic is the red flesh of the berry. Every other part of the bush secretes these toxins, which are called taxine alkaloids. Now, please remember that Ben Hines was a homegrown gardener. 
He may have handled the bushes with ungloved hands. Maybe he took his snack break or lunch break and the toxins found his way into his bloodstream and then to his intestine. Now, how does this toxin work? If it, get, if it gets absorbed in high enough quantity into the intestine, then it can cause either, either cardiac arrest or respiratory failure. In his case, it was respiratory failure. The funny thing is, with this, these toxins, there are no symptoms. When a person drops, they just drop, just like he did. Why am I sharing this with you? The world has opened up, COVID is long gone. We are sitting without masks in large halls like this. People have started daring to go out, treks, greens, whatever. If you hear of someone or if you're planning to go out someplace, please be very cautious. If you don't know the greens, don't touch them. They might be very deadly because things that look pretty, they can be pretty deadly. How many of you are likely to remember what I just said, say, a month from now? What made the difference? The story. What is it about stories that they end up sticking far longer than facts do? What are your thoughts? Huh? These words. I'm sorry? These words. Oh, there's visuals. Absolutely. I showed you Ben Hines' picture and also the berries. But if I hadn't shown you the picture, would you still be able to remember it? Because I only showed you two pictures. So visualization happened through power of imagery and words that are used. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm so glad you said that because there was a character. Now you got interested and intrigued to know what's going to happen in the character's life. You were caught up in the story so much you kept either predicting, anticipating, or wondering what next, and that kept you hooked. The amount of attention people pay when you tell a story is far more than when we share a list of facts. Here are three reasons why stories beat facts every time. Feel free to make notes, digital or otherwise. Um, so first of all, stories speak to emotions and they speak to emotions and they connect with us because this is how our mind processes facts versus stories. Facts are, facts are like post-it note. Any information that you share with people, it is only temporary. Plus, if you look at the world that we are living in today, facts refresh themselves every other day. Look at your own products, look at the company that you work for, how many people you hired, how many products were um, dispatched, supplied, used, um, rejected. <laughs> Everything is a number at the end of the day and it keeps refreshing itself. It's very hard to keep track of facts because they're very, very changing. However, a story is like a uh, like, a, like, like super glue, or if I may say it in absolutely Hindustani style, because I grew up in Delhi, um, there used to be this ad that used to come on TV and it was always played in Hindi uh, back then. Do you know, are you familiar with Fevicol as a product? Who remembers the tagline of Fevicol? I heard it in Hindi, you may have heard it in some other language, but they used to say, Fevicol ka masboot jod hai, tute ga nahi. Now, if ever a beautiful story was told, it was that. We remember those taglines, and that's exactly how stories are. When you listen to something which is told to you in a story form, it sticks with you, and it's like super glue, or Fevicol ka jod that will never break. Because, now I'll show you three reasons why stories beat facts every time. The first one is that stories are transportation devices. Stories are transportation devices. Let that sink in. Stories create a vicarious experience by transporting you into the land where you want your listeners to go to. How many of you traveled to different places? When I told you the Ben Hines story, were you imagine different? Did you imagine different places? What are some of the places that you got transported to when I was telling you the story? The garden and the neighborhood. Oh, wow. Look at the amount of detail. The garden, the neighborhood. Yes. Oh, wow. Did anybody imagine the car or the mother in the car? How many people imagine the mother in the car? It's interesting you're raising your hands because I never showed you the picture of the mother. You have no idea if she was tall or short, if she was, um, if she was lean or stout. It doesn't matter if she had gray hair or brunette, but she was a mother and you experienced and felt her emotions while she was in the car and you imagined that. 
Did, how long did the mother drive? Let me see if you remember. 20 minutes. How long did she wait at the hospital? These are facts or numbers which are wrapped into a narrative and because you felt the length of time with her, you'll never forget it. So stories are powerful because they're transportation devices so that we let it sink in. What should a storyteller do to make sure that they actually are able to transport their audience into the place where they want to take them? What do you think a storyteller needs to do? Quick responses. Build a persona. Okay, build a persona. Uh, you know, build a picture. Hmm. So use imagery. Yes. <laughs> Very good. I'm so glad you said try to build a connect through emotions. If a story doesn't feel, if a storyteller doesn't feel the story, you can't get other people to feel it. And if you don't see it in your mind's eye while you're telling it, you can never let your audience see it with you. The only way to transport it is to feel it yourself, to see it yourself. If you feel it and you see it, then you can transport people. Details matter. Sometimes we might think that people go overboard with details. But I'm putting a pin here and I'm going to tell you exactly how many details are okay or not okay. We're going to come back to that in a bit. The second reason why stories beat facts every time is because stories have the power of repetition. They're great for recalling and for retelling. Power of repetition. But quick question, if you were to repeat the same story of Ben Hines some other time, Ram, would you say it word for word exactly the way I said it to you? No. Why would your story undergo a change? The way you visualized it, your own perspective, that's the gift of a story. Once you receive a story, it becomes your own. You interpret it the way you do. And when you recall and you retell it to someone, it undergoes a little bit of change, also because your choice of words, etc., could be different. But do people sometimes, should, edit their stories deliberately? Like by choice, I want to edit the story, and what might that reason be? Absolutely, you adapt the story to suit your <coughs> audience. Here's an example. Remember, I told you about my daughter Trisha. So when she was about six or six and a half year old, there's a beautiful Burmese story that found me. I told you I'm a storyteller, right? So I stood up like a performance storyteller and I started to tell her that story. There's this one particular scene in that story, which is a little mm, icky. So here's the king who says that his chamberlain, the guy who cleans his bed chambers, about 20 years old, must get 10 lashes because he's done something horrid. So I played that out and I said, the first lash came down heavy. Top the shirt tore and the blood oozed. And he, this boy shook in his boot, it stung so bad, he begged the king, sire, please reconsider. But the king was relentless and he wouldn't do it. The second lash came down heavy. Top the shirt tore and the blood oozed. She paused. She started to cry. She said, don't tell me anymore. I don't want to know. At night, the girl didn't sleep a wink. She crawled into bed with husband and me, saying, I'm seeing blood everywhere. I forgot <laughs> that I am from Game of Thrones age. I have seen the intestine of the horse being pulled out. So my tolerance for blood and gore is high up. But for a six and a half year old, it was way too much. The big point is connecting it to business. What excites you about your product? The details, the technicalities that give you a rush and joy and you want to explain it explicitly and you know, thread bare. It's quite possible that the person that you're talking to, they don't care about the technicalities as such or how the product was made, but really, how do I use it in my context? Tell me how it fits into my world. Those are the details they're interested in. So we must, even though stories have the power of repetition, but when your audience changes, then your story should ideally undergo a change. Same product, same capabilities, but when I talk to somebody who's from technology versus somebody who's going to be the end user, operations, whatever, my communication must change. The story I tell should undergo a change. The third reason why stories beat facts every single time is because stories have the power of complexity. Let that sink in. You must be wondering, complexity? Didn't we sign up for storytelling thinking it's going to make complex products you know, more simplified? And here is Anya staying, saying that stories have the power of complexity. Now, this is how I want you to 
understand this. Remember I showed you five facts about the yew, bush, and berries. You saw the five bullet points. Now five bullet points typically or facts are like parallel lines. So what is the quality of, of parallel lines? Does anybody remember geometry from school? <laughs> they, they never intersect. They go on till infinity ever converging or intersecting. That's exactly how facts can be. They are independent of each other and they can keep floating in the universe without ever fusing or creating any sense. However, when you package the same set of facts into a narrative with progression in your story, everything falls into place. You must have walked out of good movies and bad movies, right? The mad, bad movies are the ones where you, are, you, have come out, you walk out of the movie and you're thinking, everything was fine, but I still don't understand why they showed that character in that moment and took five minutes. It wasn't necessary. Now, but... Their good stories are ones where everything which was shown, it comes together in the end and you have your aha moment. Now I know why they did what they did. That's what good business storytellers do. Anything that we mention, there's a reason why it has to be there. We'll go back to the Ben Hines story now. Let's say I have paucity of time or general lack of interest because I'm bored and I don't want to tell the first part of the story where I had earlier mentioned that Ben Hines was a homegrown gardener, born with two green thumbs, you know, did all that in the neighborhood, he became very popular. I don't mention it. I fast forward to Ben Hines was a very popular uh, gardener who was well sought after. The local authorities approached him once and said, would you like to take up this project, blah, 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 everything continues. <laughs> Do you think I'm taking away the complexity of the story somehow if I don't mention the first part? What goes away in the story? Absolutely. Now, it may seem like why is the speaker spending so much time to build up the context and the backstory of the character? Is it really necessary? In good stories and in good business stories, even product stories, when you're going to talk about a persona who's going to eventually end up using your product to change the way their world is, it's important to talk about what their world looks like today because if people don't get the context, they don't get the plot and they don't understand what you did to change that world too. Connections happen because of good anchoring in story. Nothing is there by chance or just because I love the sound of my own voice as a storyteller, but it's there for a reason. And that's what good storytellers do. They also reflect on the fact that is whatever I'm going to say, bring in that complexity in the plot that when I fit my product in and I talk about the solution that we provided, people buy it, they covet it, they desire it, and they say, hey, how can we get your same product you know, in our company? Because it sounds very exciting, it fits right in. That's the magic that we have to create. Um, now, I'm going to play a very short clip it's under one minute long. Everybody, I'm sure unanimously would agree that Steve Jobs was by far the best product storyteller ever. And uh, Apple continues to strive to meet the same standard of storytelling that, and the magic that he used to create. They're doing a good job, fairly good job, but nothing beats what Steve Jobs did. So the short clip that I'm gonna play for you, like I said, it's under one minute long. This, is, this was taken at the launch of MacBook Air. Why am I sharing this with you? Because through this, I'm gonna share with you now three techniques or tips that good product storytellers can start using right away to frame better product stories. Ready for that? Okay, great. So we will just, oh, we have to connect the audio. Is it connected? Great. So just pay, just pay very, um, you know, be completely focused on this because like I said, it's under one minute long. Don't miss a thing. And here we go. Kind of notebook. It's called the MacBook Air. It's so thin, it even fits inside one of these envelopes that we've all seen floating around the office. And so let me go ahead and show it to you now. This is it. Let me take it out here.
This is the new MacBook Air, and you can get a feel for how thin it is. Yeah, there it is. There it is. And that's it. Now, I'm going to repeat what he said. He said, it's a kind of notebook. It's so thin that it even fits inside one of those envelopes that we've all seen float around the office. Let me go ahead and show it to you now. He walks over to the plenum, picks up an envelope, comes back to the center of the stage, and he says, here it is. Uh, it comes out, and he holds it up, and he says, you can get a feel for how thin it is. That's all he did. And through this, I'm going to share three techniques with you. Now, you don't have to be Steve Jobs and leading a multi-billion dollar company and making products uh, you know, uh, like Apple to be able to become a good storyteller. These techniques can be used by anybody, anywhere, even over a cup of chai. When you have it at the outside, roadside chai wala, and it will still work beautifully. Now, the first thing that he did, um, no, we don't, we don't need the slides anymore, thank you. So when he said it's so thin that it even fits inside one of those envelopes that you've seen float around the office, now notice the use of some of the words that he made, that, that he used here. He said it's so thin. Now thin is a very interesting word because if you look at the time when MacBook Air was launched, back then nobody associated the word thin with laptops. Because even today if you go to laptop comparison sites, it says the thickness of the laptop. The word thickness goes for laptops. And back in the day, the thinnest laptop that existed, what existed was to Sony TZ, which was actually thinner than a MacBook Air. Um, but all other laptops were big and they weighed like a cement brick, which is why people used to carry backpacks like you guys do on your shoulders, so heavy. And he used two words. He said thin and he said, you may have seen it float around the office. What do you understand from thin and from float? What is the imagery that he wanted to create? Light. So thickness and heaviness went together. He's He's creating a frame of reference for you. So the first technique for good product storytelling is create a frame of reference. Frame of reference means lending somebody a lens and saying, hey, come look at my product through this lens. And the lens that he's lending everybody here is that it is thin and it is light because it's only things that are light that float in air. With me so far? <coughs> now let's ponder a little bit on how products can create a frame of reference. Let's look at mobility space. Cars are for mobility, right? But there could be another frame of reference, or a very popular frame of reference for cars today is that, you, that they are secure, they're safe to travel in, and they're comfortable. So comfort and safety goes with cars. Then there are bikes, mobility, but the frame of reference a lot of bike makers use is that it is made for thrill and excitement, correct? Mobility in e-bikes or e-bicycles. You tell me, what is the frame of reference? Fantastic. So it is, it's, for, it's for creating a better world for myself because it's, e it's easy on my pocket in the long run, plus for the world. Are you seeing how frame of, say, frames of re references are created? Airplanes travel through air. That's also mobility. But what is the frame of reference for an airplane company? Absolutely. The speed of travel, and you're a busy professional. You want to get from point A to B, point B. You don't just have to be mobile. You want to get there fast, so there is speed, there is luxury, there's prestige in it. That's the frame of reference. So every product company needs to look at, pause, and think that what space am I in, but what is the frame of reference that we want to create from them for our customers? So this is just about you thinking and sitting down at a discussion table to identify the frame of reference. Now the second step is how do you articulate it? Now, he said it's so thin it fits inside one of those envelopes that you have seen float around the office. Now the reference to an envelope, such a peculiar thing to say, right? An envelope, why do you think he chose an envelope? Connection, huh? Yeah, that too. And also the fact that, what's your name, sir? Gaurav. Which company do you work with? Yellow. Yellow.ai. Yellow 
imagine, Gaurav, before you joined yellow.ai, imagine if you were working for Intel, okay, or Cisco, their partners, Apples, to create this technology. You were sitting in PST time zone at home through a virtual streaming. You see Steve Jobs launch this product. You're so proud that your company supplied chips and cetera, et cetera, to make this technology possible. You catch up with your friends for breakfast the next day, and they say, God of Bhai, what did you do on Saturday night? And you say, dude, I saw the launch of the thinnest laptop in the world, and guess what? My company helped make it. They say, really, how thin is it? And you say, it, one, it is 1.7 mm thick, provided you remember 1.7. I could be wrong. It could be anything. But nobody ever made facts go viral like that. So big point, if you have to articulate, use simple language and articulation to express it better. Now I'm going to leave you with three words. Uh, you learned it in grammar or in English. It's called similes, analogies, and metaphors. Good storytellers use similes analogies and metaphors. This was a simile. It is as thin as an envelope, because everybody will remember an envelope. You might forget the facts as to how thick or thin the laptop is. So use similes. <coughs> metaphors. What are metaphors? Imagine me saying that a TV um, is, na is the new dining table. I'm using it metaphorically. A TV is a new dining table. What I mean by this is I'm thinking of a of exactly collective. I'm thinking of a frame of reference where people gather around a TV to watch a match to cheer for their best team. They gather around a TV to cheer and pray for that real um, or reality show singer that they are rooting for. People gather in front of TV. So if the conversation now is not about woofers, it is not about pixels but it's about size because the bigger the dining table was, the more people you could accommodate. The bigger the TV is, more people can gather around it. So use that. And the analogous experiences, you can research it, talk about it more. I guess my time is up. And the third thing that I want to leave you with, because I promised you three techniques, is show is better than tell. That's what he did. He showed it. The laptop slid out of it. Look at how can you create show demos. Can you get customers to talk about how it impacted your product, impacted their lives, etc. But show is always better than tell because people believe what they see. I hope the power of story stays with you. Thank you. Do we Thank have you. A question yes. yes. Okay. Thank you, Tanya. So we can open for questions. And I have the first question for you. Yes, please. Yeah. So the attention span as of now is 8.25 seconds for a person. Like, how do you think we can get hooked for uh, the moderator or the, the people who we are pitching to, especially when we are pitching a startup ideas to investors? So how we can be that person will be hooked to our idea? That's a good question, you know, considering with shorter attention spans, how do we hook our audience? I think the magic is in beginning well. You may have heard this saying that well begun is well is half done. So if you begin well, if you can deliver a hook, your audience wants to see what else do you have under your sleeve and they want to stay with you. So if anything, do some research on how to begin my meetings or my conversations well and how can I deliver a hook. Typically, I've already told you similes, analogies and uh, metaphors work very well. Explore that space too. And there are many other, but research on that. Yes. Questions? Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, how can we, hi, I'm Radhika Jain. Hi, Radhika. Uh, how can we remove predictability from our stories? Uh, when we're telling a story with the one that you had started, because we'd already known that this is about cherries and uh, the whole concept, this story would have been regarding that, right? How do we remove that? Did it take away the joy of listening to the story, even if you knew how it's going to end? Just asking you, Radhika, as your personal opinion, because you were listening to the story. Did it take away the joy of listening to the story? Because you anticipated something bad is going to happen to Ben. Mm -hmm. um, I would, <laughs> no, I would still listen to it, yeah. Yeah, and that is the answer. Sometimes, especially when you are going to share a success story about your product, and you're going to go, people know you're going to go pitch and you're going to tell them how your product fits into their world and how it's been supremely successful. 
it is the, the end is anticipated that you will tell me this works magically and I should use it. But they still want to listen to it because the magic is in the twists. It's the middle part that good storytellers should focus on. So if I have to leave you with a tip here, predictability is not the problem. The problem is that I, I hope you had obstacles along the way that you can tell me about that you've experienced during implementation of the product. And what were those obstacles? How great were they? How did you overcome those obstacles? Because that's, that would show me your competency, your ability your, uh, to, to solve for uh, unexpected things that are happening. How did you go or maneuver yourself around it? Magic is always in the twist. The end is not worrisome at all. You go watch Karim Johar movies, you know how they will end. You go watch Mission Impossible movies, you know Ethan Hunt will always uh, make that impossible mission possible, but you still go watch and you pay so much of money because you want to see how he does it. Focus on the how. 83. Yeah? 83 launched. 83 movie has come about that. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody knew that word. Exactly. And yet we watched it because we wanted to see how it happened. You've got that. Yeah. Any other questions? Do we have time for other yeah. questions? Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. You, you talked about. Uh, changing the narrative or changing the story as per the audience. How does exaggeration play a role? Because a lot of stories, especially movies, are grossly exaggerated. You look at our uh, epics like Mahabharata, you know, if, if you say Brahmastra, it sounds amazing. You would have said it took a bow and barrow and nobody would listen, right? Yeah. So does exaggeration play a role? I'm so glad you asked that question. It's such a beautiful question and it does make us ponder, right? That. Um, you know that, and that's why we associate that uh, element of a little bit of falsehood and uh, an exaggeration um, and play of words when somebody is telling a story, and which is why stories get a bad name in business. And if I if I may be allowed to use a little bit of colloquial language in Hindi here, kahani mat suna because people don't believe that the story that you're telling that it's anchored in truth. Which is why we at Storywalas. We believe, we have a definition for stories in business, which is that good stories and good business stories are always anchored in truth. They are just well told. So you look at narrative techniques and ways to engage your audience in a way that they pay attention. And how do you customize or curate your stories to suit your audience? You are still not lying or exaggerating, which is why our definition is stories in business are always truth, well told. Have I answered you? Anyone else? Yeah, I have. Yes? Is a, uh, the question is like, uh, uh, it's, it's related. Will there be a time in business uh, that you don't have to tell a story? I mean, uh, uh, sometimes you realize in the moment that story is not what needs to be told here. Uh, you took an example, right? Kahani uh, Matsuna Mudipya. Someone who is more on, uh, fact oriented, someone who talk about, uh, think about data. And uh, so, will there be a time where story is not the fit or? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. Congratulations for thinking that way. Yes, absolutely, there are times when people don't want to listen to a story, especially the longer version of the story, and they prefer data better. But there's this myth and misconception that data is different from story, and they don't collide. But actually, frame of reference, if I may call it that, or articulation comes into data as well. I'll give you an example, OK? How can I? How can I use storytelling or narrative techniques to project data? 33% of our buyers are repeat customers. Can you visualize it yet? No. Thank you for your honesty. I'm going to try it another way. Three out of ten of our buyers are actually repeat customers, and we couldn't be happier. Is it slightly better? Let me say this one, this way. One out of every three customers that, you know, buyers that walk out of our store, they're actually repeat customers. They have experienced our products before, they have loved them so much that they keep coming back for more. Let that sink in, one out of every three. Was that tad bit better? The art is in how do you say it, and if people want to hear data, facts, you can just wrap the facts into a beautiful narrative and make it easy to chew and digest. So you can do that through storytelling. And not all stories are long stories. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, I think we need to close. If you guys okay. have any of the questions, doubts, you can reach out to her. Uh, she'll be here in for uh, yes. some more time. Thank yeah. you. Enjoy Thank your you. success.
Thank you, Tony. A small token of appreciation from Sandeep.